The impact and urgency based on the way the customer answered the questions was filled in, thus yielded the priority. The end user that submitted the information uh, is linked into my address book here. If I wanted to, I could drill down into this user and look at assets I've associated with that user, tickets they've submitted in the past, whether it was a, uh, a work order in IT, an incident in, um, uh, excuse me, uh, a work order in facilities, an incident in IT, etc. We also can see physical assets that I've been assigned as well as am actively logged into based on the integration. So you get a nice customer profile. If we go back to the incident here, of course, we still have the categorizations by the technicians. They may look at the information provided by the end user and say, you know what, that really is a monitor issue. Let's go ahead and get them one. This is not working. Uh, we'll get you another one. So this is the field the end user is going to see. We also have then the internal fields they're not going to see. wonder what he did. Assets. This is the integration with the asset core. Now, this individual may not have been actively logged into a device um, that was under management. If he was, it would have automatically populated his asset here. I can choose to add asset. I can search for a serial number, an asset tag, the person's name. Doesn't matter to me. Let me pick here. Who can I put here? Um, Try to think of an asset. Let me choose this asset here. And this data is live, real-time data. And once you select the information, as I was mentioning earlier, you can see some of the highlighted data is available directly in the ticket. But I also can spawn out to an additional tab and do a deeper dive interrogation of the asset, who's logged into the asset, what's on the asset, what the hardware configuration is, what the software configuration is, and if I need to act on that device, let's say he said his machine was running slow, I could look at the running processes directly through my browser here. I could stop them and start them. Maybe I want to spawn an advanced action, like user says their machine's running slow or they think they have a virus. We can initiate a virus fix, launch virus scan. Maybe they requested access to the network share, like in that new hire form. We can map a network drive. I'm just going to throw up a perform system maintenance to just to show you very quickly that that action now gets logged against the asset and I have a record of it. Um, running low on time, let me flip back to the asset here. Let me um, talk about the impact analysis screen because I think there's um, you know something neat to be said for that. So let me very quickly just search for a server. So I have two servers that are called email prod one and email prod two. If we click on a server in particular, you know maybe somebody says, I got a notification um, in IT that uh, this server is running high on CPU or something. So we can, we can go and look at the server, and the value of doing that would be to run an impact analysis. So what does this server do? What is going on with this server? Well, right off the bat, I can see that it's connected to a switch. The switch is a Cisco Catalyst 2960. I can see there are, there are multiple open changes logged against the switch or the, ser uh, the, the server. Pardon me. I can also see that these, this server makes up or is a component of email that I provide to the business. We call that a service. I can also visualize that information, and I can see oh, the server is connected to the switch, has some changes, and makes up e you know email. Well, maybe this is an email. Maybe this is something called, you know, um, Amtablue or something. I don't, I don't know what it is as an IT guy. I might say, well, you know what? How important is email? We can analyze email. And you can literally just drill down and, and continually find useful pieces of information. Well, email is a service consumed by 25 individuals. That's my entire organization. There's actually a problem somebody reported with email. And we can start to just backtrack and look at, oh, and look at this, some changes against email. And if you wanted to go out even a layer further, you could do that. That's probably going to get a little messy here. Yeah, that got a little messy. But the idea that we can track all the information against this data, whew, 
lots of problems, lots of lots of changes, etc. <laughs> it's it's very useful at the at the first level. Oh, I went three levels. That's why it got so bad. Let's do two. It's a little better, um, but you know, nonetheless, it's a it's a, it's a great visualization, vis uh, a great way to understand what's going on in your environment. Uh, very quickly now. Um, I do, before I, I let you guys go or, or open it up for questions, just reiterate and, and drive home the concept of the portals and the consoles. Let's say that HR was also using the solution. When HR logs in, they are taken to the HR portal. They're presented with the HR console. The HR console has things relevant to HR. We have HR news tied into RSS feeds. We have a corporate holidays widget. We have only the service catalog options that pertain to HR. We have the new hires that have been recorded. We have the cases. And if I click on, oh, we have the FAQs, right? If I click on new case, you can actually see there is a new case form that, uh, that HR does have to deal with, different types of requests, job changes, etc., cetera, uh, versus the form that IT saw. The portal's different, the console's different, the, the, the information provided is different including the information they have access to either through security or through the way that you've um, re created your different console views. All right, well, there's Johnny. I'm not sure why I couldn't see Johnny before, but, but one last thing before I turn it over to the mediator here is if we look at, I can see that as a result of the way I filled out that form, we have to provision an SFDC account and retrieve an I-9 form, right? So different different things happen for different reasons. Okay, um, Dick, do we have any questions in the in the room? Well, we sure do, and and uh, thanks, Adam. Great job. Uh, I, I know we're getting close to the top of the hour, so if, if you all want to want to drop off, that's fine. But we'll stick around for a couple minutes and answer some of these questions. So if you have an additional question you want to submit, uh, now would be a good time to do that. The uh, the first question that's up here is, can a new hire form take values passed on from external systems such as Oracle via CSV, XML, email, and so on? Uh, it certainly can, yes. So there are integration capabilities. Uh, for those familiar with version 11, they are the, the same, but they've been built upon. Um, and what I mean by that is e emails that are formatted in a particular way uh, can automatically drive workflow. So if an Oracle notification said category equals X, priority equals Y, uh, username equals you know Johnny, it would fill out those individual form elements. And when, an e when a ticket got created, that met those required fields, it could spawn additional workflow, so, so most certainly. Uh, we do also have the ability to run rules on a scheduled interval. These rules might perform uh, SQL queries into ODBC data sources for the purposes of looking for new information that we might use to populate inventory items or update their status from an ERP uh, or something along those lines. So that, that we often see integrations to that point. Uh, and we do have an API a SOAP API, which you can leverage to create tickets, search co tickets, contacts, items in the CMDB, but we try to get a, steer you away from having to perform any sort of development, um, which is why we've included all the visualization features. Next okay. question. Okay, Th thank you. Does it, does it support web services then? Is, is that an API? Uh, web you services, know? SOAP API, yes. That's okay. correct. <clears throat> Next question. How are you guys handling agents who also may need to be a customer, that is, a systems engineer who is an agent, but he or she needs to open a help desk ticket for a system with his or her monitor. So in other words, if you work on the help desk and your own system breaks, what do you That's do? Right. That's right. Or you're working in, on the help desk and you need to make a benefits change with HR, right? Right. Um, so certainly the, what I showed you, and that's the value of the portals and the consoles. So it's, there's no longer a self-service interface versus a technician interface, there is a portal. And if you are an HR rep and your HR portal has all the forms and, and the tickets and the charts for the things you do day in and day out, you can still have a, a new IT ticket button 
And when you click that button, you will get the customer flavor of the form as opposed to the agent or technician's flavor of the IT form. Prior versions of Footprints, you kind of had to uh, flip-flop between the self-service portal, as it was defined, and the technician interface. And Footprints could get confused, as could the unfortunate users. Um, in 12, the portals don't care what your role is. It simply displays the content you need to see. Okay. Uh, great answer. Next question. Uh, related, the other question I have is, can 11.6 and 12 coexist on the same front-end app and back-end SQL? In other words, I have a development environment and I like to, to play and learn 12, but I don't really want to request an additional development service if I don't have to. Uh, so the, uh, Yeah, I, I have installed Footprints version 12 on the same web server as Footprints version 11. Um, I can tell you that Footprints version 12 leverages uh, Tomcat, um, you can integrate it with IIS, but it is not a requirement. Um, that being said, there are disadvantages to having both running on the same platform. They're completely separate, and they can certainly do so. Um, so if you're resource restricted, I would say, uh, you know, feel free to do so. Just get a hold of support and make sure, um, you know, you let them know and ask them for the specific uh, things to look for. Um, but, you know, it, in the end, best practice would say uh, stand up another server. Um, when you go to upgrade uh, or migrate, as it were, it is a migration. Unlike prior versions of Footprints, when you went from uh, 10 to 11 or 9 to 10, etc., they were kind of in-place upgrades. Uh, version 12 is a migration. Uh, we have some great tools that are have been designed to assist you uh, in the migration. The migration is going to be available uh, for for general release uh, very soon, probably in, in fall um, or late fall, if not early winter. Um, but in the interim, if you wish to get a hold of what's called a migration advisor um, or something to those, to those lines, uh, it's a product or tool you can run against your production 11.6 installation or 11-something. Um, um, and it will generate a report that tells you specifically, here's what's going to have to happen, Here's how long it's going to take, right down to the to, to you know using a best uh, guess on algorithm based on your actual data, so you can plan accordingly. Um, the good news is a lot of the stuff that you had to call support and get a workaround to perform in version 11, we've built into version 12. So the report will literally say this this workaround is no longer supported. Go into version 12 and configure it here. So while the the migration won't bring that over because it was a workaround, there's now a place inside of the UI to perform that configuration. Uh, and that migration advisor does a great job of outlining and documenting everything you're going to need to know uh, to make an informed uh, plan uh, around your migration effort. 